Leviticus for Beginners. This is lesson number 11. Uh, the title of this uh, lesson is Observing the Day of Atonement, chapter 16. Um, let's look at our outline here to fix exactly our position with regards to our study of the book of uh, Leviticus. If you notice, we have uh, the two main sections of the book, Attaining Holiness, the first 16 chapters, and we have done uh, a, B, C, and D, we're going to do D today by observing the Day of Atonement, obtaining, attaining rather holiness by observing the Day of Atonement. And then uh, practicing holiness, the last uh, chapter 17 to 27, we will list these sections when we begin them in our next lesson. For now, I, I'd like to review and comment on the clean and unclean section which we briefly covered uh, in our last uh, lesson, a single lesson, and we covered maybe four or five uh, chapters. There are a few points that I'd like to make and clarify before we move on to examine the most important ritual done only once per year by the high priest, and that was the, uh, the Day of Atonement described in chapter 16. Uh, but before we get there, a couple of things I'd like to emphasize. First of all, in this business of clean versus unclean, I want us to remember that uncleanness did not equal sin. To be unclean at that time, to be unclean meant that a person was not in a condition to come before the Lord at the tabernacle and offer any type of sacrifice. The rules for clean and unclean in regards to food or leprosy or various bodily discharges for both men and women and regulations for women after they uh, gave uh, birth uh, were instituted by God to form a pattern of behavior that reflected and honored God's innate character of holiness. Remember we said, how do you describe God? You know, He's transcendent, he's glorious, he's inscrutable. So by accepting and willingly following these preconditions for coming into the presence of God, the Jews were following God's rules and his procedures for being ceremonially clean and pure and thus able to approach the living God without danger or rejection because of some form of impurity. God gave the rules simply because humans would not know what was clean and unclean as far as God was concerned. Again, to be unclean was not a sin and did not require sacrifice in most instances. The exception was when someone was healed from uh, leprosy and we covered that in our, in our last lesson. So a person unclean for one reason or another was not ashamed, did not feel guilty, it was something that happened from time to time that needed to be remedied, usually through bathing and or cleaning objects that had become uh, contaminated. Secondly, there were some advantages to the clean and unclean system. For example, from a theological perspective, the people had a clear set of rules uh, which they could both uh, by which they could both please God and maintain the holiness of God's tabernacle and his nation. They understood how uh, they were to be in order to approach God. There was certainty there. Uh, from a moral perspective, the rules encouraged sexual behavior and respect consistent with God's broader teachings concerning moral conduct in matters of of sex. And then from a practical perspective, this clean and unclean legislation led to a healthier lifestyle for the, uh, for the people. Another point I'd like to make uh, about this uh, clean and unclean uh, business, uh, some characteristics of uncleanness. Although Christians, uh, as Christians rather, were not subject to these laws in order to come before God. Why? 
Well, Christ has cleansed and continues to purify us with his blood each day. In Acts 2.38, we find out how we become clean by repenting of our sins and, and being baptized. And then in 1 John chapter 1, verses seven to nine, we learn how to remain clean, and that is by confessing our sins and acknowledging them before God. And the Bible says that he is faithful to continually forgive us and keep us clean by the blood of uh, Jesus. In addition to this, God has put the spirit of God within us so that we don't have to go to a place in order to approach God. We are continually before him and continually cleansed to do so by the sacrifice of Christ serving us through our faith in Jesus. Because we have faith in Jesus, his sacrifice continually cleanses us. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we are continually in the presence of God and we are able to be in his presence because through faith, he continues to keep us clean. He continues to maintain our uh, ceremonial, if you wish, cleanliness uh, so that we can remain before him at all time to offer uh, sacrifices of praise and, uh, and thanksgiving. However, this being said, the old system described in Leviticus had its own features. For example, cleanness was not contagious, but uncleanness was. Just as one infected with a virus today can pass it on through contact with others, uncleanness could also be passed on through contact with things or people. Also, certain categories of animals and birds, etc., were unclean, but not a category of people was ever considered such. The poor, those who were uneducated, those who lived in the city versus those who lived in the country, no one person was considered unclean because of who they were. Thirdly, uncleanness was a ceremonial condition, not a moral condition. It was inconvenient, it was time consuming, but it wasn't shameful. Also, removing uncleanness mostly required guaranteeing, uh, excuse me, quarantining, bathing, cleaning, uh, or disposing of various clothing or objects along with uh, visits with priests or offering of sacrifices to uh, publicly confirm our purification. And indifference or ignoring the rules about clean and unclean led to sin and eventually punishment uh, by, uh, by God. Number four. Uh, basic reasons for these laws. Why these laws? Let's read Leviticus chapter 15, as if we don't know, you're gonna, you're gonna find this one familiar. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 31. Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, so that they will not die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is uh, among them. So the primary reason to protect sinful humans in close contact with God in their midst. They also helped the Israelites, these rules, also helped the Israelites distinguish themselves from other nations who may have had different names and languages and territories, but they shared eating habits and pagan lifestyles and also low moral standards which were similar to one another, but which were quite different when compared to the Israelites. They stood out because of what they ate and what they didn't eat and what they did and what they didn't do and what they worshiped and, and, what, and who they didn't worship. Another point here, do these laws apply to us today? The answer is they no longer apply to us, however, we can still learn from this teaching and experience of the Jews. There are teaching opportunities. For example, we now know that none of these rules apply to Christians in the Christian age, 
and we need to watch out for those who would try to impose this uh, on us. Paul says the following in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. So we can eat pork, we can eat any type of fish, uh, and bodily discharges of any kind do not render us impure before God. We can associate with any person or culture for the purpose of the gospel. Some people are lost and need the good news, but no one is considered automatically unclean. We know through Christ in Mark chapter 7 verse 19 and through Peter, Acts chapter 10 verses 12 to 15, that no food is unclean and we can eat any food and our prayer of thanksgiving to God is what purifies what we eat. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. Our only restriction on food is when we hurt someone else's weak conscience by eating what a brother, what another brother believes is forbidden and we, we move him to do the same against his conscience. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 14. In other words, we, uh, we eat pork and we're free to eat pork if we want to, uh, but there's a brother in Christ for whatever reason feels that you know, he shouldn't be eating pork and we eat pork and we encourage, oh, don't worry about it, you know, go ahead, you know, there's no problem, you know, don't be like that and he goes ahead and violates his own conscience by eating what he thinks he shouldn't eat. Uh, we're responsible for his broken conscience. And Paul tells us that uh, uh, we shouldn't do that. Uh, we should not uh, bring a brother to a point where he violates his conscience. Our freedom should not you know, be the cause of someone else's sin. And so we, we do have a responsibility to restrict ourselves for the sake of the conscience of a brother for whom Christ died. Another uh, valuable uh, lesson uh, and parallel is the pursuit of holiness by believers. They did this by following the ordinances given regarding, uh, regarding clean and unclean for the purpose of maintaining ritual cleanness and purity so they could interact with God at the tabernacle. The New Testament does not require Christians to be ritually pure, but it does require us to be morally pure. For example, in 1 Timothy 5.22, Paul writes, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So the idea of cultivating a holy uh, attitude, a holy life is still part of our responsibility as, um, as believers. Uh, but Paul tells us we do this by cleansing ourselves not of uh, meat or food or, th or touching things, but from the defilement of the flesh and spirit. In other words, the sins of the flesh, the sins of the spirit. He says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We know who God is, a great and mighty God. And so we get rid of sin in our lives. We, we get rid of lust. We get rid of impurity in our lives so that we can stand before God uh, without, without fear. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, John writes, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, part of cultivating holiness is um, uh, based on who we love. Who is it that we love? What is it that we love to do? 
Uh, is our love completely devoted uh, to self-gratification? Is our love uh, always directed at things in the world in order to satisfy our needs? Or is our love to satisfy our need to please God, to do what God has asked of us, uh, to live in such a way that reflects His holiness in our lives, uh, which gives light in this uh, dark uh, world. We are uh, God's holy nation and we strive to be and remain holy and pure until God, before Christ in unity with the Spirit. So how do we do this? Well, first we distinguish between what is clean and unclean before we consume it. I'm not talking about food here. I'm talking about media. I'm talking about books and pictures and music and images and entertainment that we consume. For example, pornography is impure, it's unclean. Comedy that is filled with vulgarity and blasphemy is unclean. Movies filled with unholy ideas that glamorize crime, that use women as objects, that promote what God has described as an abomination. This is not what Christians should be consuming if they're striving to be pure, to be holy. In other words, we don't need to be concerned for spiritual reasons what food we consume, but rather what words and ideas and images we consume and what words and ideas that come out of our mouths. That's what we should be concerned with. What does Jesus say in Matthew 15? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those things defile the man. We still pursue purity and holiness, but we do so in a different way today. All right, so those are some comments I wanted to make uh, about the clean and unclean laws that we were talking about last time. Let's move on, shall we, to the Day of Atonement in chapter 16. The Day of Atonement given by God at this point of Jewish history is at the center of a Jewish law. It was meant to be a permanent statute, Leviticus chapter 16, and it is still observed to this day, known by its Hebrew, its Hebrew name, Yom Kippur. It was about atonement, that which leads to or results in the forgiveness of sins. The Hebrew word kapar, translated into the English word atonement, mentioned 15 times in chapter 16 alone. That word meant to cover over or to atone, to pacify or to propitiate. In other words, on the day of atonement, Israel's sins all of the sins of the nation were covered over, were purged, were removed. As I said, it was at the heart of Jewish law and it appeared near the middle of the Torah, in the middle of the third of five books. Chapter 14 is the exact middle and the atonement information is in chapter 16. God provides instructions about the Day of Atonement with appropriate warnings about the importance of careful observance. So let's read chapter 16, verses one and two. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. The idea here is that God controlled the times and the manner that the priests could approach him in the tabernacle. That was not something that the priests decided, that was something that God decided. And uh, uh, in this passage, God uses the recent deaths of uh, Nadab and Abihu 
as, as an example of the consequences for not following his instructions. First, God outlines in general terms the steps taken to accomplish the atonement or the purification for the priest and his family, the people and the tabernacle itself. There are steps. So step number one. Step number one is the priest would bathe completely to ensure his ritual cleanness. Step number two, this is for the Day of Atonement now. Step number two, he would only put on the basic clothing of his linen undergarment, his linen tunic, his sash and linen turban. These were his uh, working clothes, if you wish. In coming before God who appeared above the ark, covered by the mercy seat, you know, the, the cover of the mercy seat that had the two angels facing each other, the high priest entered as a servant without the ornate trappings of the high priest, which he wore before the people. Uh, you know, when I talk about the ornate trappings, you know, the, uh, the ephod with the 12 precious stones on the breastplate and the two stones on his shoulder pads and the gold plate on his turban, all completed with his uh, uh, multicolored robe made with finely woven threads. He didn't wear all of that when he entered into the tabernacle, into the holy place, into the holy of holies. Step number three, he would bring various animals to sacrifice first for his own sins, then other animals for the sins of the people. These constituted a burnt offering and a sin offering for himself. The bull was for the sin offering. The ram, which is a male sheep, the ram was for the burnt offering. He would then receive two male goats from the people, one for a sin offering and one as a scapegoat. Step number four, once assembled, the procedure was as follows. First, the priest would offer the bull as a sin offering for himself, as well as the ram for himself as a burnt offering. Next, the two goats were presented before the Lord at the tabernacle as a sin offering for the people. The priest would then cast lots in order to determine which goat would be offered to the Lord and which would be the scapegoat. Next, the goat chosen for the Lord would be sacrificed as a sin offering. And then the other goat was presented live before God and then to make atonement was set free into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Next, once the instructions were given, the actual sacrifices would be made. This passage describes in greater detail the offerings that were presented and previewed in uh, verses three to 10. However, the same order was followed. Offerings on behalf of the high priest and his family of priests, offerings on behalf of the people, then offerings on behalf of the tabernacle and its contents. All of these had to be atoned for cleansed and sacrificed. This section provides additional details like the following. First, the use of incense in offering sacrifices. The priest entering the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood of the sacrificed bull on the mercy seat, the cover itself. Only when the smoke of the incense covered the ark was the priest allowed to enter the Holy of Holies in order to sprinkle the blood of the bull. If he entered before, he would die. The idea behind this was that the smoke from the incense would mask the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Sprinkling the blood seven times on the mercy seat on the top of the ark and in the air in front of the mercy seat. By doing this, he made atonement for himself and his family. The goat sacrificed and whose blood was sprinkled in the Holy of Holies served to atone for the people as well as uh, purify the tabernacle uh, complex and all of its uh, utensils and objects. 
it was thought that the tabernacle, because of it being situated in the, uh, in the midst of uh, a sinful and impure and unclean people, became unclean itself simply by being in proximity of the people. You know, it's like putting a brand new white shining building you know, in the middle of the oil patch somewhere. You know, eventually it's going to get dirty. All right, well, it's the same thing. They put the tabernacle, the presence of God, in the midst of sinful people. Uh, the idea was the sinful people, just by being around the tabernacle, would ultimately contaminate it. A little like one being close to a, a leper could catch the disease by contagion. With this in mind, the blood of both the bull and the goat were sprinkled on the altar of burnt offerings in order to purify it and in so doing purify all the furnishings and elements in the entire tabernacle, tabernacle complex. Next, the high priest would lay both hands on the head of the remaining live goat this was a gesture signifying the transfer of the sins and transgressions of all the people of Israel. Then another person would lead this goat out of the tabernacle complex into the wilderness and release it to wander there. The significance here was that the sins of the people were atoned for by the death of one animal and they were removed from the people and sent away out of sight and out of mind. All right, so step number six was the following. Once all the offerings for the Day of Atonement were completed, the normal activities of the tabernacle complex would resume. Aaron would bathe his body and get dressed once again. He would resume his priestly duties. The men who had brought the live goat to the wilderness and had disposed of the sacrifices made in connection with the, uh, with the Day of Atonement, both had to wash their clothes, bathe themselves, and once this was done, they could return to the camp. Step number seven was making a statute of the Day of Atonement, making the statute that this would be a permanent day. And we read about this in Leviticus chapter 16, beginning in verse 29. It says, this shall be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you, for it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. So the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. He shall thus put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall also make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once every year. And just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so he did. So these verses reveal four truths about this observance. First, it was to be observed permanently on the 10th day of the seventh month, six months after the Passover. Secondly, a day of rest and uh, humility. It was to be a day of rest and humility, a time of fasting and prayer and devotion. Thirdly, a responsibility of the high priest. Uh, this uh, particular, uh, not feast, but observance rather, was to be the exclusive responsibility of the high priest handed down from one generation uh, to the next. And fourthly, it was a day when atonement for sins was accomplished, a day when the high priest, the people, and the place of worship were all purified. No matter where you were, it was a fresh start. It was a time 
for rejoicing. We, uh, we've read where the law, uh, where the laws rather, were given, which naturally led them to being broken. And now where, when, and how those who broke those laws were forgiven and restored. So as I said, remember we talked about the cycle. The cycle uh, describes how the uh, Jewish nation uh, at a high point were, were one with God, celebrating with God, doing what was right with God. Then slowly but surely, they began breaking the laws, falling away. They were uh, punished, they were called out and so on and so forth. And then there was a restoration. The people would come back to God. There'd be a celebration. And once again, they'd be at one with God. Well, the day of atonement was the high point of that cycle. And it was to be celebrated, it was to be uh, uh, kept each year, no matter where you were in the cycle. Uh, the Day of Atonement was to bring everyone back uh, into a, a relationship with God because sins were all forgiven and all things were restored. Well, uh, in both the Old and New Testaments, uh, purification required blood because it was the most precious substance available to man since it contained life itself. That was the point. It was, it was more precious than gold or silver because it, it contained the essence of life. So far in Exodus and Leviticus, we've reviewed the reasons and procedures for the sacrifice and the offering of the blood of animals as atonement and as forgiveness for sin. These, however, were a preview or a shadow preparing us for a far superior offering of blood to be made at the right time by Jesus Christ. I say far superior for five reasons. Number one, it was the offering of one who was both human and divine. Such an offering was far better than those of animals. You could sacrifice a million bulls and offer their blood, but the offering of Jesus and his divine person, his blood was significantly more valuable than any number of bulls or sheep or, or, or animals. And so the offering that was made by Jesus was both human, perfectly human and divine. Secondly, in the reasons why Jesus' sacrifice was superior than the sacrifices offered by the priests in the Old Testament. Jesus' sacrifice uh, was a willing sacrifice. You see animals, they had no choice. Animals don't have free will. They simply were led to the slaughter. They didn't choose to offer themselves. But Jesus, as a man, had free will. He freely offered himself as a sacrifice, making his sacrifice uh, extremely valuable. Thirdly, his sacrifice was a sinless sacrifice. It was holy, it was innocent, and it was clean. The only criteria for an animal to be sacrificed was that there be no physical defects in the animal. But Jesus' sacrifice was not just no physical defects, he had no spiritual defects, no moral defects. The sacrifice was absolutely pure and sinless. Number four, it was a once for all time sacrifice. Animal sacrifices were required daily in the morning and in the evening. And then they were required for all kinds of uh, breaches of the law. Uh, they were required when you got better. Uh, you know, it was ongoing, morning till night, day after day, year after year, century after century. But Jesus' sacrifice was offered only once and it accomplished everything that it set out to do uh, one time. It uh, covered the sins of everyone, uh, everywhere for all time, all sin. And then number five, 
Jesus' sacrifice could take away sins once and for all time, as I, as I mentioned before. Animal sacrifices arrested sin and put sin into a, a kind of a suspended state until Jesus' sacrifice completely eliminated them because his blood was worthy to make proper atonement and secure eternal forgiveness. In this way, Jesus' sacrifice fulfills the purpose and the promise of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. That's why we study the Old Testament and why we're studying the sacrificial system in order to better appreciate and put into context the sacrifice offered by Jesus. So this concludes the portion of the book of Levit uh, Leviticus dealing with the sacrificial system. Here briefly are a few lessons that this section teaches us, and I mean very briefly. Number one, lesson number one, God takes sin seriously. Being holy himself requires that he punish sin, that he punish unholiness. Don't ever be mistaken. There's no such thing as an innocent or you know, unimportant sin. God takes sin very seriously. Secondly, the just punishment for sin is death since sin contaminates us and inevitably leads to both physical and spiritual death. As Paul says in Romans 6.23, the wage of sin is death. The result of sin is death. Every time, there's no exception. Number three, God graciously offers his own son's blood or life to atone for our sins and to obtain forgiveness for them. That's the purpose of the uh, cross of Christ. That's the message of the gospel. You reduce Christianity down to its simplest forms. God offers Jesus as a sacrifice, pure and holy, in order to pay the price for our sins. And he pays the price for all of our sins. And all of our sins are forgiven. They're taken away like, you know, the scapegoat out of mind, out of sight. They're taken away once and for all and forgiven forever. I often tell the congregation when I'm preaching, don't look back, because when you look back, what's back there are your sins and they've been forgiven. Look forward instead, look ahead to the reward that God has promised those who remain faithful to him. And then lesson number four, we receive this atonement and forgiveness through faith. We accept it through faith and that faith is expressed in repentance and baptism, Acts chapter two, verse 38. Okay, so those are some lessons that uh, we can draw from the material we've studied so far. Give you a little uh, reading assignment here, chapters 17 to 20 for next time. So I hope that you do that and we will continue in our series. We'll see you next time, God bless.